One of the people who has decided that she is a success story, who regards herself as one of the giants of American journalism, is Taylor Lorenz, who used to work at the New York Times, caused one drama after the next, then made her way to the Washington Post. She basically, as we're going to show you, started her career by hanging outside of houses that are filled with 16 and 17 year and 18 year old TikTok influencers where she would try and induce them to speak to her and give her secrets. She would go and get 17 year olds canceled. And so she built a TikTok platform just by using the names over and over of 17 year old boys who were extremely popular among adolescent girls even though she was 40 when doing it. And somehow this convinced her that she's some kind of like giant of American journalism who now is in a position to issue state of the media addresses, similar to the way the president issues a state of the union address. And so she went to TikTok to talk about the reason why her entire generation basically has proven to be complete failures. And I think it's really worth listening to what has, she has to say obviously not because there's any wisdom in it, but because it illustrates the pathologies and sicknesses that have caused the collapse of that part of the media and the unbelievable inability to accept responsibility. Even though she purports to say some of this is our fault, you'll see in the way in which she says it, it's really just the pretense of accepting responsibility, but not actually any attempt to grapple with the true pathologies of media. The entire journalism industry is basically in a free fall. Today, the Los Angeles Times laid off 115 employees. They wiped out their entire DC bureau in an election year. They laid off pretty much all of their sports teams. They killed their entire tech and business section. They laid off breaking news writers, social media editors, the list goes on. But what's really dark is this is just the latest in months and months and months of layoffs in the media industry. In fact, tens of thousands of journalists have been laid off in the past year. Major media companies like BuzzFeed News have completely shuttered their news operations. Time Magazine also just laid off a ton of people and oh, Sports Illustrated basically shut down last week. Pretty much the entire digital media ecosystem that myself and a lot of other millennial journalists came up in has been completely hollowed out. And it's not just digital media. I gotta just let her repeat that sentence because I love it so much. It's like, kind of sweet dessert just entering my body and animating every one of my cells. Listen to this sentence. Entire digital media ecosystem that myself and a lot of other millennial journalists came up in has been completely hollowed out. And it's not just- The area of media that myself and a lot of my fellow digital millennial journalists has come up and have been completely hollowed out. That is exactly what has happened. And there are very good and valid reasons for it. And while I said, as I said, I don't take pleasure in watching people lose their jobs and be sad about it, I absolutely take pleasure in the hollowing out of industries that are very toxic and damaging to our, to our society and to our republic, which includes this one. Just digital media sites. Local news has been obliterated. The newspaper industry is cratering. Radio is essentially dead aside from NPR, which has been gutted. Meanwhile, hundreds of workers at Condé Nast, the parent company of pretty much every major magazine from GQ to Vogue to The New Yorker to Vanity Fair are on strike because they're also facing impending layoffs. Even mainstream national media outlets owned by billionaires like The Washington Post, where I work, and The Atlantic, where I used to work, have done layoffs. If you're young journalists say there's almost no on-ramp to traditional journalism. Even if you do get a job, journalists' salaries have been stagnant and even declined. And by the way, we don't make that much to begin with. I don't think people understand how bad the world would be without journalists. Oh, people understand that the world would be bad without journalists. In fact, that's exactly the problem we have, is that none of these people are actually journalists. They do not perform the journalistic function. The journalistic function and if you go and look at what people for hundreds of years have been describing as the core purpose of the press, the reason there's a freedom of the press guaranteeing the First Amendment is because we need a mechanism to confront and undermine and subvert and check institutions of authority and the most powerful people in our country. That's what journalism is for. It's to bring them down pegs. It's to expose their secrets. 
And what instead has happened is that these people who work in these corporations have done the opposite of that. They're the ones who are causing our country to be without journalists, even though they bear the HR title of journalists because they have done the opposite of what that function is. They serve power. They disseminate its propaganda. They do not challenge or investigate these institutions of authority. The people they investigate and challenge are ordinary citizens in the country. Taylor Lorenz's biggest story as a journalist was uncovering the private citizen who ran the Libs of TikTok account. Taylor Lorenz has never challenged or exposed any lies or secrets or corruption in the CIA or in the FBI or in Wall Street or in Silicon Valley. I think her second biggest story is that one time she was in the app Clubhouse and she heard somebody use the word retarded and she ran to Twitter and told like a tattletale and she attributed it to Mark Andreessen and it turned out Mark Andreessen had not said that so she had to correct her second biggest story. Taylor Renz has more corrections appended to her stories than almost any person working in media and the, the amazing thing about that is her stories are so trivial that it's almost impossible to even get an editor to care enough to correct them, and yet she has a mountain of them. Long ones, big ones, major ones. And yet she seems to think she's the success story, and on some, on some level, bizarrely, she kind of is, given that she's at least been able to draw attention to herself just because she's so, she's just such an extreme, she's almost like high camp at this point. I have to say that I've kind of look, come to appreciate Taylor Lorenz in the way that just these kind of people can have this sort of campy, iconic appeal. But there's nothing positive about her journalistically, except for the fact that she provides a window into the pathology that is causing it to collapse. So she is right that society is worse off without journalists. And the problem is, is that the more people employed by these big media corporations, the less journalists we have. And that's why I say it is not just well-deserved, but a cause for celebration to watch these outlets that have done far more misleading and far more propagandizing and far more attacking of ordinary citizens than powerful break down and collapse and disintegrate because they're anti-journalism and not journalism. And because of their failures, People are paying increasing attention to independent media, people who have offered something that the public is interested in to develop a level of trust and faith that you can find people who will inform you, who will do their best to tell you what they see is happening. You may not always agree with them, but you know that they are at least doing their best and have no constraints, no corporate constraints on the sorts of things they can and can't say. Do you know how many times during Russiagate when it was dominating the news when I was out there constantly expressing skepticism and doubt and pointing out all the evidentiary flaws in the primary Russiagate narrative that every day, almost every major uh, corporate outlet in this country was ratifying and endorsing. I got emails or DMs from people who work inside these media outlets who are people who are kind of mid-career writing to me and saying, thank you so much for doing what you're doing. I wish I could do it, but I feel like I can't. Because in corporate media, in liberal corporate media, the minute someone steps out of line or sticks their head up in any way to challenge liberal orthodoxy, they get mauled by liberal Twitter. They become the first on the list for when layoffs happen and the last to be hired. Because no editor, no news outlet wants to be screamed at by liberals on Twitter for having hired a heretic. And every journalist who works in these major corporations knows that the only way to advance is to stay in line, to be conformist, to serve orthodoxies and never to question it. And nothing is more corrosive of the journalistic spirit and ethos than that. And that is why these sectors are collapsing. When I watched that video from the Washington Post's Tell Lorenz, the one I just showed you, in which she kind of postured as the dean of digital era American journalism sermonizing about what went wrong and what she referred to as her sector of the media. I was so transfixed by the utter absurdity of that person that I really could not muster a rational analysis of anything she said. Taylor, by the way, now identifies as a disabled person because she claims she suffers from long COVID 
and various immunosuppressive disorders, which is more or less exactly what one would expect from her. So perhaps the deep compassion that I feel for her predicament also prevented me from being able to dissect this address that she delivers to the public about the state of the media. But fortunately, someone put into words exactly what my sentiments about all of this are. She is the media analyst and political commentator Hannah Cox, who, among other things, is a fellow of one of my favorite DC activist groups, the White Coast Waste Project, which has done a remarkable job in building a very bipartisan coalition to oppose federal spending on gruesome and completely unnecessary medical experiments on animals. And in a single tweet, Hannah not only identifies the glaring and hilarious flaws in Lorenz's pretentious speech, but way more importantly, she identifies these broader developments governing the collapse of traditional corporate media and the rise of independent media. So as soon as I saw that tweet, I reached out to her and asked her to come on to discuss her analysis and was very delighted to, uh, when I learned that she had the time to do so tonight. And we are very delighted to welcome her to her debut appearance on System Update. Hannah, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm excited to talk to you about all of this. Thank you so much for having me. I'm a huge fan of your work, so it's wonderful to be here. That's nice of you to say. Thanks. So before we get into these broader themes, and like I said, I don't want to make this uh, focus on Taylor ends in part because it's not particularly significant, even though it is extremely entertaining to talk about her. I just want to get your kind of what was your visceral reaction upon listening to that that video? <laughs> Well, I, like you, just love to hate on Taylor Lorenz. I think that's the only reason she has a career is because she just makes people so angry they can't look away. It's a total train wreck. And, you know, I run an independent media company called Base Politics. We are a nonprofit, but we are in this sector where we are focusing on new media, on podcasts, on YouTube, on Instagram and TikTok. And I found it exceedingly condescending, first and foremost, her assertion that journalism is dying. Journalism is alive and well. People appreciate actual journalism and they're willing to pay for it. What's dying is the mainstream legacy media that has failed to innovate and that also, like you said, has become more of an arm for the state and more of a propaganda machine than actual journalistic outlets. So I guess they don't assign who moved my cheese to read in journalism schools these days, but I think people like Taylor need to pick up the book because the amount of entitlement that came across in this video really just slaps you across the face. You know, she's saying that these outlets are owned by billionaires and yet they're laying all these people off as if because these people are billionaires, they should have to keep losing money for crappy work that people don't want to pay for. At the end of the day, her work and that of many of her colleagues is not creating value for people. People don't trust it. I saw a recent poll that actually said 50% of Americans believe that the mainstream media intentionally lies and misleads them. And so she doesn't connect this fact that in order to have a job in doing something, you have to create value in that job. And she's no longer doing it, but she expects to still have a cushy job and thinks all of her other colleagues should as well. Meanwhile, the people I think who've worked in the sector for some time, who have energy, who are entrepreneurial, who have the sort of innovative genes, they've left these companies because they are very restraining, because you cannot speak truth to power within them, because they often are so bi are so partisan that people really can't talk about things that matter or ever sort of cut through all of the noise out there. And so the, those types of people have already left, and they're doing just fine on places like Substack and YouTube. Um, she tries to undermine people in this kind of capacity and say that they're not as trustworthy, they can't be fact-checked, or their videos are too short what people want is shorter video and sometimes long long form video as well um, but on top of that this assertion that these people are less credible than her is hilarious because the mainstream media gets it wrong all the time you know from covid they were not the ones that broke the story by the way on who was actually funding that wuhan lab it was the white coat waste project who you mentioned earlier who i'm a fellow for who happened to be doing the work of journalists because they were filing freedom of information acts trying to figure out if gain of function was happening because it is animal torture and so they had sort of the smoking gun they couldn't even get the mainstream media to publish that information for well over a year and it wasn't until Rand paul took that information and encountered dr fauci with it that all of a sudden you saw the mainstream media start to change their tune and say, oh, maybe we were funding this lab. Maybe this thing could have been lab created. I think the amount of trust that people have lost in these institutions is valid. They are not in any way more credible. Their fact checks are often laughably incorrect. I recently had to run a fact check on the fact checkers at USA Today a few weeks ago because they were claiming that there isn't a kill switch that they put in place for all vehicles beginning in 2026. Representative Thomas Massey 
was trying to get that overturned, and they were calling him crazy, saying that this hadn't been passed and using really ridiculous language to sort of dance around the fact that that was exactly what was in the legislation. So from really big things like COVID and its origins to war to basic pieces of legislation and what's in them and how it's going to impact the American people, they aren't doing their job. They are not credible. There's no way that you can hang their hat on what they're doing. And so people are right to turn to independent media. And lastly, I'll say just before I pause, you know, I also I also thought there was a lot of a victim mentality in Taylor's video, which you often see from Taylor. She really likes to play the victim. And I just think that it is such a slap in the face to journalists who are actually putting their lives on the line. There have been over 80 journalists killed in Gaza in the past couple of months as they are trying to report on war crimes that are happening there. You yourself have put yourself on the line and endangered your safety, both in the U.S. and in Brazil at times. Like there, Julian Assange is still sitting in prison for his reporting. I mean, there are so many journalists who are doing incredible work and who really are sacrificing everything to bring people information and to try to push back on the powers that be. And so for her to try to play victim uh, was just really disrespectful, I thought, to the actual craft of journalism. Yeah, I, I, that, that time that she went on MSNBC and started weeping about how essentially she's so uh, endangered because people criticize her on the internet when she has never in her life challenged a single person of any power. I've watched people like Julian Assange rot in prison. I've seen journalists killed in war zones. I've been, I, you know, I, several governments have attempted to prosecute me and illegally spy on me and all kinds of journalists who, as you say, put themselves in danger all the time. And these millennial journalists who basically have turned themselves into arms of the powerful really believe that because they're occasionally criticized by people on Twitter who then are uncensored, that they are actually somehow really victimized. And you know, one, it, it was amazing. One time uh, or a couple times now, Taylor Lorenz has been allowed to write articles and columns that refer to me. And, you know, I know I'm polarizing to a lot of people, but my journalism and its my career speaks for itself. And she was permitted to repeatedly refer to me as if it were my title as a right wing influencer, while, as though I'm like some sort of TikTok dancer, while, you know, she continues to call herself a reporter, and the reason is, is because ideologically the Washington Post sees me as an enemy, and therefore anything goes. And I think that's so much of what people have come to realize about this kind of new crop of journalists is they have thrown all caution to the wind. The other thing I would just want to pick up on what you said, the obviously it's always going to be the case that media outlets are going to make mistakes. This has been the case forever. Human beings make mistakes. Human institutions are fallible. The solution, though, when you make a mistake is that you own up to it as quickly as possible. You account for how that error happened. You apologize for it. You correct it. You retract it. The lies that we're talking about that this sector of the media has told that is now failing are not trivial stories or incidental details they got wrong. They were the ones who, for the first several months of the pandemic, pronounced that it was proven that the COVID uh, pandemic did not emanate from a lab in Wuhan and that anyone who said otherwise was engaged in false conspiracy theories to the point that they got censored from the internet. The thing that drives me the craziest to this day is that prior to the 2020 campaign, they ratified the CIA lie. It came from the bowels of the CIA that the reporting on Hunter Biden and his uh, activities in Ukraine and in China in connection with the Biden family was Russian disinformation. Everyone now knows that was a fabrication. Not one media outlet has that spread those lies has ever felt the need to come and say, here's why we got this wrong. We apologize for having done so. Here's what went wrong. Here's what we're gonna do in the future. Why is it that, why do you think it is that people like us can kind of look at these lies that they have told on so many critical stories? They drowned the country in Russiagate for two or three years only for that investigation to end debunking the core conspiracy theories. So many examples that you can give. And I really think they don't see that, that they don't see that they have been more responsible for the dissemination of disinformation than almost any other source of information in the United States. Why is it that you think they're so incapable of understanding the validity of these critiques? Oh, I don't think that's that they misunderstand. I think that they are arrogant. I think that they have 
every assurance in their minds that the government's going to come in and save them and shroud them from competition. They're working all the time for this right now, right? And Taylor Lorenz is notorious for going after tech and saying the government needs to regulate tech companies more. And you'll often hear them going after things like Section 230. There was the Journalism Competition and Preservation Act. They're, they're introducing all these bills saying we're trying to protect journalism. We want to make sure that journalists can still compete in a modern world. But really what they're trying to do in these pieces of legislation, when you dig into them, is eliminate independent competition. They are on, They are really trying to ensure that independent media outlets, independent journalists cannot compete with them. They're trying to find ways where they can get together and collectively bargain with social media companies so that only their articles and links can appear, essentially. I mean, it's really, really corrupt, but I think because they do work so hand in hand with the state, and you're correct, they absolutely worked with the state to censor people on social media during COVID. But, you know, oftentimes when they're getting their facts or they're bringing you their sources, it's just people in government that they're talking to. It's not like they're going on the ground and really like getting in the nitty gritty and doing serious reporting. They're just calling their buddies in the intelligence community and then just trotting out whatever line they're given from these guys. But because they have had that cozy relationship for so long, I think they have every assurance that they believe the government's going to come in and save them and squash their competition. And they really don't, I don't think they have totally wrapped their minds around just how far out of the gate this is. And that's because they have been so slow to innovate. You know, they, most of the people who are running these newspapers or who are writing for them, they're not the innovators. The people who are, they're already out here doing the kinds of work that you and I are doing. Um, so they don't quite understand just how far gone it is. TikTok is now the top search engine for, I think, 40% of Americans and growing every day. People increasingly do not trust institutions whatsoever. They're seeking out individuals that they like, that they have you know, good relationships with, that they identify with online. That's who they want to get their information from. They have a healthy distrust of the media. And they've seen how corrupt the media is as well, not just in their horrible reporting style, but in the tactics that they use. You know, Taylor herself has outright doxxed people. So, I mean, she's gone so far as to actually publish people's home addresses and work addresses and then has the audacity to go and cry about online bullying and harassment that she faces. They lie about people. They ruin their reputations. They try to get people fired. I mean, people are not going to forget this kind of thing. I think when it comes to the pace of the media and how often they're wrong in their reporting, that can slip by people because because Americans are busy and there's just so much news coming at them every day. But these deeper sentiments about the way they behave, I don't think are going to be forgotten. But I do think people need to be on guard against these kinds of legislation that they're trying to pass in order to try to squash competition. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.